It's the most wonderful time of the year. And it maybe it isn't. It's maybe the least wonderful time of the year. Bill Bailey, author, dancer, oh, and a British comedian on writing, performing, and dealing with Christmas. Pick up a phone, make a tough call, a thing that you've been putting off. Like, you got to talk to, oh, I don't want to, yeah, but you really got to, that's the time to do it. Trust in yourself a bit more. Take a bet on yourself. How do you uh, write a joke? You know, what's funny? And my answer would always be, I start with a laugh and work backwards. <laughs> so there you go. You have a laugh and you go, ah, ha, ha, ha. Mm, what would cause this amount of comedy? So I was thinking, this is it. It was like a light bulb moment went off. I was like, I should just let go. What did you enjoy more? Strictly come dancing or performing at the Royal <laughs> Opera House? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a tricky question there. Welcome back to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. Before we get into this very special episode, I'd like to wish you a very Merry Christmas. And I hope this Boxing Day you are warm, thoroughly fed and surrounded by loved ones. It's not always an easy time for some, as we remember those that are no longer with us. But I do hope some of that wholesome cheer will rub off on you just a tiny little bit. And huge congratulations to our giveaway winner, Sonny. Thank you so much for your thoughtful feedback and the suggestions. You have some presents on their way to you. And now, without further ado, Bill Bailey. Bill, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, you're welcome. Such a pleasure to have you here. No, oh, it's so. My pleasure. I was watching a Netflix do uh, Netflix show mm -hmm. called Wednesday. I don't know right. if you're familiar with it. No. About Wednesday Adams from the Adams family. Oh yeah. And at the same time as I was watching the TV show, I was reading your book, The Remarkable Guide to Happiness. Right. And what struck me about Wednesday in the show is that how multifaceted she is. So, you know, she plays the cello, she right. writes a novel, she's right. uh, very good at detective work, she's, yeah. you know, martial arts. And reading a little bit about you growing up, you also had many different interests. So you were sporty, yeah. you, um, you know, were musical, you were very academic as well. You have many different interests and you were quite good at yeah. many different things at the time when you were growing up did you feel like you had to focus on any specific thing well i think that that was a, a, a real um a, you know feature of my childhood was that i i didn't really know what to focus on because i had so many interests like you say um i was it was unusual, really. Uh, I think the school that I was at didn't quite know what to do with me, really, because, you know, uh, normally there's somebody will show an aptitude for academia and perhaps not for sports or vice versa. But I had an interest in all of these things. You know, I was captain of the school cricket team. You know, I played, I was the lead in the school play. I played instruments. I was, you know, um, on track for a, a bunch of, you know, good results. So they thought in my A levels. So it was difficult, I think, um, for me and for them. And I think it led to a bit of conflict and a bit of, you know, there were, I, I certainly felt that there was a couple of occasions when teachers didn't quite know. You know, I had a music teacher, brilliant music teacher, who was my, who was a real inspiration to me, and an English teacher as well. And so the two of them I actually were arguing, you know, over what direction my academic life should take. So it's always been a feature of my life, I think, since I was a kid. Um, and I think what happened was I ended up focusing on performance because um, I was I had an aptitude for it, I had an affinity for it. You know, I was did the school play. I could play instruments. I could play the piano. I taught myself the guitar. It was it came naturally, and I think that's what really led me down to the the path that I pursued since. Mm. Did you envisage that you will do what you do now? No, not mm. at all. I mean, I listened to a lot of comedy when I was when I was growing up. Me and my mates would listen to comedy albums, you know, like the Monty Python had comedy albums. Um, and, you know, my, my dad was a big fan of the goons and he listened to the goon show 
And so I, you know, I was aware of humor on albums and around at the time. Um, but it didn't occur to me that this could be a career. I mean, mm. Not at all. I mean, it was something that you might do, pursue as a hobby, perhaps, or something. Then you'd have to have a, a proper job. And then this would be something you'd do for fun. Yeah. I always fascinated with, you know, when people discover their talents or, you know, how do they decide what to kind of go down on? Because I feel like especially, you know, when you're younger and for, you know, even for my generation, there wasn't really a process of figuring out, you know, how do you no. even decide if you're good at that? And I suppose my question is, like, did you, at which point did you realize that you were funny? Well, I mean, it's a, it's always a tricky one, that. I mean, I think that there was an occasion where I saw the power of comedy, and I think that had a big impact on me, and that, that maybe subconsciously uh, you know, sort of set me down, set me along a different path. Was, and it was actually a funeral. One of my <laughs> elderly aunts died, mm -hmm. And there was a sort of wake at our house. And, uh, you know, it was all very sort of serious and somber. And, and I was a, just a kid, you know. And, and at the time, there was a comedian on British TV called Les Dawson. He was a brilliant um, pianist. And he would, but he was, one of his, the uh, parts of his act was, he would pretend to get it wrong. I mean, he would get it wrong. He would try to play Tchaikovsky and he'd get, deliberately get notes wrong. Mm. And it was, Hilarious to me as a kid and to many other people. And so I'd learned this routine, right? And and so my dad was talking to someone, an elderly woman, very, very seriously, and he was taking a sip of tea. And I was playing this this routine and getting these notes wrong. And my dad just thought it was hilariously funny. <laughs> and he spat the tea out. He just he was drinking the tea. He went, mm, you know, <laughs> and he just spat the tea out all over this woman. And my mum saw this happen and swore and she'd never swore. i've never heard my mum swear my whole life mm -hmm. right she swore and dropped a cup and the saucer smashed on the floor it was like you know and i just thought it was like a little chaos bomb going off you know what I mean? like it Sketch. was like wow mm -hmm. what just happened mm -hmm. you know that was this is this has made these adults behave in this way and i thought oh that's Something lodged in my mm. in my memory there on that on that day, mm. but with, knowing that you're funny, I mean that's another thing. Um, I guess you make your friends laugh. You know, you you uh, you're able to impersonate teachers. You can you know. <laughs> that's a very useful quality which is quite at school. A, yeah, yes. <laughs> make you lots. Of that's friends. what it would. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. You know, make fun of the teachers. Um, me and a pal would make up sketches and we perform them in a little review at the end of term. And uh, I guess it's sort of, you know, just one of those things you just... ...watching that uh, TV show. Mm. And in your book, you say that... Um, You've always been a little out of step with the mainstream of society. Yeah. I mean, did you feel like an outcast yourself? And how has that impacted your work and outlook? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that, you know, it, it, the, the idea of following a certain path that was seemingly preordained, you know, laid out for me, didn't work for me it mm -hmm. just I couldn't see myself doing it I couldn't see myself pursuing this um, very well-trodden path go to school get some good results go to university get a job you know in finance or something which so many of the my school friends did or some established job some path and I just I don't know there was one of my favorite writers is a, a writer called Somerset Maugham. And he talks about when he was a kid, he had this thing, he said it was a fever in the blood. And I guess that's what I had. It was like this, this kind of, you know, this urge, this desire to break out of what I saw was a kind of a conventional path, do something different, you know. 
And I watched comedians and I watched musicians and I just thought, this seems like a more exciting life, mm. you know. And I guess that's what I meant by that. Mm. You're very good at combining so many different elements and also doing different things like writing books mm. and, you know, TV shows. And I suppose it's it's almost like different elements of performance mm. and creativity. So you have this ability to kind of like put so many different things together in a very unique way. I mean, yeah. how do you, you know, looking at your your career, your work, how do you measure success for yourself? Well, I uh, I think there's um, there's a few measures. I think a few few ways you 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 gauge it. I mean, um, for me, it's about being able to feel that I'm uh, what I'm doing is is artistically uh, engaging and rewarding and satisfying, and that I'm still engaged in it and I enjoy it. Um, that you know, lots of people enjoy it. Lots of people come to the shows and they enjoy it. And I think um, a measure of success is also, I think, I, I do set some degree of of that to um, critical uh, success as well. Whether it's kind of seen as valid, you know, whether it's validated as a as what I've done is 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 held up for scrutiny and deemed to be good you know mm. I think that's for a lot of artists that might be a, a degree of success but also I think working with people and getting the admiration and respect of your peers I think that's another big part of it mm. I think so because it's also getting that kind of external feedback from people that you respect and yeah. you like and getting that yeah, um, I think so. Yeah, I think that's a real big part of it. Mm. I mean, we are human beings and, you know, we we don't exist in a vacuum. So, no. you know, we, we as much as we say, oh, you know, it's like you have to you know focus on what you want. But also, you know, getting, especially being a comedian, you do need that feedback, right? Because sure. that's what, it's a relationship. When, like, when you're on stage, it's something that... It's not just, you know, you come in, you've done your lecture, you go home. It's a, it's a conversation that happens with the audience. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and, you know, the audience are, are an essential part of it. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you, you know, I can write something which I think is funny and I can perform it to the best of my abilities, but none of that makes any sense until the audience get involved, mm -hmm. you know, and then that, that completes the whole part of the puzzle and then it, it sort of, it's, it's a... It is literally greater than the sum of, it, of the parts. Mm. What's your process? Like, what's your process for writing a show? Well, it normally <clears throat> starts with, with a lot of reading and research. You know, I love to know about subjects. You know, I'm very curious about, you know, music, particularly history, politics, um, science. And these are the subjects that I read about a lot. And then something might spark my interest in that like a little fact some little thing some nugget will leap out at me and i think oh that's interesting and then i might just pursue that and try and expand that into me trying to you know and the comedy would come from me trying to understand it i mean i did that once with uh um the book a brief history of time by stephen hawking i was stuck in an airport <laughs> And this was the only English language book available. <laughs> so I was in Indonesia. So I bought this book and I read it. And I and I I did a whole bit about me trying to understand it. You know, he said, a brief history of time. How can time be brief? Surely time is infinite, <laughs> you know. And how can time have a history? Surely time is an unbroken chain from the past to the future. It can't have a history. And I'm, I said, I can't even get past the title, you know. So that's where you, that's where it might start. It might start with something like that. Um, it might start something that happens in the news, a, a, a strange event, an odd occurrence, a bit of research that's come up saying, you know, um, there was a bit of research. Somebody, the scientists have discovered the uh, equation for happiness. You know, there was a big sort of, you know, <laughs> yes. what the hell's that? You know, mm -hmm. so, you know, that sparks a bit of thought in my mind. And it could just be something that happens to you. It could be a, a life event, some something that you've gone through and experience um you know like um when uh, i went with my family and we toured around china and we we um bought 
an owl that was in captivity and released it. And so that became a big story. You know, mm. that still turns into a routine. So it could be a, a mix of things, really. But it always starts with research. Mm -hmm. So there's this big element of living your life, following your interests, mm. reading about it. And I suppose this is where combining your the way that you have grown up and having so many multiple interests and almost like scattering yourself into so many different directions and mm. then like picking some certain moments and combining them in really interesting ways. Yeah, that's that's mm. it. I mean that's that's really it, you know, and the 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 comedy, the stand up element of it is is very much drawn from that sort of approach. The music is different. The music is slightly different. The music is a an idea that has to appear fully formed mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. like i say i think of a i think of a juxtaposition of styles say tom waits sings you know um old macdonald out of farm you know how do we get that to work can i realize that in a comedic way and then you and then that becomes a, a routine that becomes a song so those that's a slightly different approach but yes you're right i mean it's very much I found something that I can do, which combines all my interests into one, you know, area, which mm. is stand up. I'm, you know, I can do all kinds of talk about any subject, play any instrument, play any style of music. It's all of my interests in one place. Mm. I have been learning a lot from just observing you and how you have followed your and created your own path, because something that I personally struggle with is focusing so much on kind of work and output mm. and almost forgetting that the rest of the life sort of exists. And I don't know, I'd love to take your take on it. But for me, it's like I know that I'm supposed to focus on my life as well because that's what feeds into my work. Mm. But, you know, for a lot of people, there's the separation between what you do for your job and what you do outside of that have been able they struggle to kind of combine the two any mm. advice that you would have for kind of following your interest and how that feeds into your work well for you you're saying for creative people for creative for, arts or for anything for anyone for any, for any anyone. kind of yeah. job any life mm. um style any any pursuit yeah maybe uh, even less for the creatives because i feel like if you're creative you're already to some extent following that passion yep. but perhaps for people who didn't and trying to i guess create more of a, a balance and more harmony in their life so you're saying you know, someone's say doing a job and it's long hours and maybe it's hard and actually it's but it's you know it's paying the bills and so outside of that routine you want to find a way to try and you know explore your own interests exactly <clears throat> mm. i mean i think that there's so the, the the for me it starts with simple stuff you know it it would be about firstly trying to find that work-life balance and trying to uh, uh, find time for the things that you want to do i mean that's obviously the thing we're all you know we're all a bit sort of up against it time poor this you know never seems to be enough hours in the day but i think that you can make that happen you know you the, part of the reason well, not part of the reason but one of the things that came up from the research of my book about happiness was that we we can find that balance by being a bit more disciplined you know with your time and allocate a certain amount of time to something even if it's just you know reading even if it's just taking time for yourself even if it's just going for a walk for me it's going outdoors outside being amongst you know trees find time to do that just breathe in some air by lake or river or walk go outside because somehow that really kind of resets everything for me and i always try and do that every day whether it's on the bike or just a walk around the around by the river um that's a good start and i guess yeah you just have to you have to be realistic i think you have to be you have to figure out what it is that you want from this time that you've that you've you know put aside for yourself mm. um a lot of people uh, i think you know i've noticed over the years that people are extremely um uh, sort of you know 
dedicated to their pastimes in this country. I mean, I, I, I mean, it's and everywhere you go, in fact, all around the world, you find people that are just, you know, particularly bikers. When I go out and biking, mountain biking, cycling, they are still out, you know, at first light. You know, mm. it's like they they they're so keen to pursue their pastime that they will really go out on a limb to do it. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm just always amazed by that. <laughs> People just, you're out, you know, it's, it's freezing cold. It's, the sun's not up yet. And they're still there out there cycling, getting their hour in. You know, I think, yeah. I love that. I applaud that. I, I recently did a, a dive course. I, I did my rescue dive course. And I went out to this lake out, to, uh, out near Heathrow. It's a freezing cold lake. It was December. It was snowing. It was the coldest day of the year. And we were diving in this lake with all the wet, uh, dry suits on and thermals. And we we were there because we had to do it as part of our course. The place was packed. Mm. It was packed. <laughs> I mean, I was <clears throat> just staggered <laughs> that all of these people mm. were there for fun. Mm. We were saying, what are you doing? Are you doing a course? No, no, we just come here for fun. <laughs> We do this every we just, weekend. We do this every weekend. It's yeah. fun. Yeah. And I love that. You know, I love that dedication that people have for, because they say, and I, I actually asked one guy and I said, why do you do this? And he said, oh, it's a way of switching off my mind. It clears my head. I put on a dry suit. I dive in the water and I'm just weightless and I can just, you know, decompress, well, you know, declutter your mm -hmm. thoughts. That's a very efficient way of staying in the present moment because i mean not that i have done it but i've been in cold water before yes. and it's like you literally cannot think of anything else no so if you have all survival these, like, <laughs> yes exactly but i think also the, the human body responds positively to when you put yourself under some extreme stress yeah and then especially if you survive the experience yeah. then you're like oh great life is worth living i'm yeah. okay i'm good to go that's it yeah i think that's it i think there's all sorts of there's all kinds of um, benefits to cold water immersion. I think that more and more people are realizing that yeah. actually getting out and getting into cold water, get, having that sort of initial, you know, obviously you do know you're doing it in a controlled environment, but if you know, you know, if you if you're there, you 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 do it gradually, you get used to it. I think people get a huge amount from it, but not just that. I mean, there's all kinds of things. I mean, that's just one thing. My uncle, my uncle is in his late eighties, and he plays golf every day, mm. every day. Doesn't matter, rain, wind, shine. It doesn't matter. He's out there, and it's it's almost like a kind of religion for him, you know. But it's good because it's gets him. It's a routine. Yes. You know, it gets him out of the house. It's it's a bit of a physical activity. He gets the blood pumping, has a chat with his mates. It's a bit of social interaction. That I think is I is like all the elements for a good life. So much. So exactly. Yeah. Mm. Going back to your performances and how do you balance the need for being funny and combining either socially important or serious topics? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, that when I'm doing a comedy show, my prime, you know, sort of aim is it should be funny. I mean, the funny is really the, the aim. Key. That's the key, mm -hmm. you know, and if everything... Everything is at the service of that. You know, I would just want people to come along, laugh for a couple of hours, and go away feeling, I don't know, light-headed, whatever, or just they feel a bit more they've been had a taken out of themselves. And so that's really the prime uh, kind of aim. But if along the way you can slip in a bit of, you know, history, a bit of some serious subjects or maybe anything that's, you know, you wouldn't necessarily assume that that would be funny, then all the better. That to me is, that's the challenge, is to try and deal with subjects that perhaps on the face of it aren't hilariously funny, but mm -hmm. you can draw out the comedy by the way you approach it or how you, you know, can sort of extrapolate humor from it that's really that's the challenge i always set myself mm. i think looking at us human beings and how we behave and 
it's just almost drawing attention to some of the things that are just ridiculous or common yeah. or like why we do the things we do. And I think laughing at ourselves is one of the the key things. And I think you kind of do that very well in terms of just drawing attention to to those peculiarities. Yes. And life's absurdities. Yes, yeah. exactly. What is humour? Hmm. Well, um, I, used, I, I always used to get this question. People would say, you know, how do you, you know, how do you uh, uh, write a joke? You know, what's funny and all those of it. And my answer would always be, I start with a laugh and work backwards. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. You have a laugh mm. and you go, ah, ha, ha, ha. Mm, what would cause this amount of comedy? And then, you know, but actually very often it comes out of, you know, something unexpected. I mean, sometimes it's things that you just don't expect. It comes sort of, you know, from a tangential angle. You think, oh, I didn't, how did this, what am I, you know, a cracker, we're a Christmas cracker, and you open a cracker and there's a joke in it, you know, and somebody read the joke wrong. And then <laughs> that becomes, you know, funny because it's an inversion of what should have happened. Mm -hmm. You know, you take the thing, you read the joke, and everyone goes, oh, roll their eyes, it's a, you know, cracker joke. Yeah. But actually, <laughs> you get the, if you get the joke wrong, suddenly it takes me down a different path. It was like, you know, um, um, you know, somebody said it was a knock knock joke, and uh, but instead of saying knock knock, uh, somebody said, "Who's there?" <laughs> like they said the sort of middle bit of the joke first, and then the other person said, "Knock knock," <laughs> and the joke happened backwards. We were just falling about, <laughs> but that just it was just a random occurrence, like something where it's familiar. But it happened in an odd ang an odd order. Things like that. Comedy just sort of it comes from you never know actually where it's gonna come from. You never know how it's gonna happen. A lot of it is in in a, in shows that I've done in the past, very often it came from odd things that happened to me. Mm -hmm. You know, just strange mm -hmm. things that happen in life. You know, like I, I I talked in the in the last show I did about being in in uh, Indonesia, and uh, I turned up to get a domestic flight, and the flight had left early, right? And what? Uh, yes, <laughs> like, and I was like, it's like this bosses never, in London. <laughs> yeah, this never happens, mm -hmm. you know. And I was like, well, you know, and I was so, I I just couldn't believe it. And I said, what do you mean it's left early? And they said, yeah, yeah, they just, you know, it was they they got all the passengers on. They thought. <laughs> They got most of the passengers. Yeah, that's we've what got the critical said. mass here. Yeah. We don't need everybody else. <laughs> we got else. enough people. Yeah, that's enough. And yeah. the weather's. They said he actually said we were worried about the weather was going to change, so we thought we'd better get the flight going before the weather. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> this never happens. What the hell? It's not even something that I could have factored in. And no, arrived early. You, can't, yeah. you can't factor that in. Mm -hmm. Things like that were just really the strange things that happen. And actually, one of the things that we've had that we've you know I realise is that a lot of it comes from my travels you know and that a lot of being out in the world just you you naturally encounter odd situations like this which are all grist to the mill for for comedy mm. why do you think we have a need to laugh as humans well i think that it's uh, it's something that i've i realize is particularly after the last the events of the last couple of years when we've been separate from uh, everyone we've been on you know we've been sort of enforced in our own homes or solitary it's a communal experience mm. and it's something which i think is so important to us as a species as humans we actually not only do we enjoy it we need it we need that sense of community of a shared experience you know i think it's one of the things that defines us as a species is that you know we do better uh, as a group, you know, um, there's a, a, a sort of a great, um, it, was a, it was a bit of a revelation that I, I just, I, I read about us as a, as a species, you know, if, um, uh, it, it's about evolution, you know, we say that, that actually, we have evolved individually as humans. And we have all these, you know, attributes that we've kind of imp gradually improved over the years. But actually, the uh as a group as we are we do better when we all 
you know, we've all sort of changed all together. And I think that that's very important. I think that, you know, our ancestors did really well in a tribe, in a group, mm -hmm. a clan. That's when, that's when they really sort of surged forward in terms of like, you know, um, culture and uh, language and, um, you know, things like agriculture and things like that. Things that really sort of propelled the human race forwards in exponential leaps was when we worked together. And I think that that has a hangover in the modern world in terms of large events. I mean, you look at the football, look at the World Cup we've just seen. A huge communal sense of togetherness of fans, people watching a global audience of Lord knows how many billion. But and on, and in, a, in, a, in a performance um, sort of scenario, you see like this sense of being part of something of being, you know, togetherness, belonging. It's one of the chapters in my book about in happiness. Belonging, being part of something, is an essential part of being human, I think. Mm. So a joke's funnier when you have a bigger group. Well, I don't know, actually. Mm. I mean, with the whole idea of, like, canned laughter, it's like if you hear someone laughing, like, you're almost compelled to do that anyway. Yeah, that's but true. I, and talking about... I'm just sort of thinking out loud. No, that's true. I think that's right. I mean, I think that often, you know, in a, in an when I'm looking at the audience, sometimes, you know, I tell, do a joke or something, funny, and you see somebody laugh, mm -hmm. and then they'll look around at all their friends, and they're like, "Oh, I'm just like, meant yeah, to laugh now." Yeah, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is that, <laughs> and then they, they, they and they'll look and nod and they'll laugh. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think you're right. I think that you 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 are sort of in a group. You maybe feel less. Uh, self-conscious and that's mm. inhibited mm. yeah no that makes sense what's been your worst joke my worst joke <laughs> yeah. okay. uh, what well, you mean the one that just the one that uh, a joke that just people just didn't say looked at me in horror mm. um, I don't know actually I mean I think when you start out you, you're still sort of trying your, trying out comedy and you you don't quite know what your voice is, so sometimes you 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 do a gag or you'll say something that that you've just tried out and it just hasn't Flopped. worked. No, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'd say the 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 joke that um, it was actually it it was I didn't have a, an end to it. I started mm. a joke and I had no idea what I was doing, and that was actually and it turned into something which was actually in the end it worked out to my advantage. But when I started it, I didn't know where it was going. I was doing a gig and I used to be in a double act and the, and the partner that I did the double act with was on holiday. So the, we couldn't do any gigs. Anyway, the club promoter phoned me and he said, look, we can't get, a, we can't find anyone. Would you do it on your own? And I was like, oh, I was a bit self, I was like, a bit nervous about this. I don't know. <laughs> and he goes, well, look, you know, it's there if you want it. So in the end, I said, all right, I'll do it. And then I was doing this act, which normally was a double act. And so I was trying to do my part and his part as well. All right. And it was just going really badly mm. because I because I would say, oh, what about and then try to incorporate what he would say into what I was saying. And I was getting it wrong. I was sort of misremembering it. It was just kind of... People were the audience were like looking at me. Like, what is going what on? What the hell is <laughs> what? What is this? Yeah, this is this guy doesn't know what he's doing, and it's mm -hmm. true. I mean, it was kind of true because I was, I was trying. Thought I thought I would be able to, you know, remember what he said, but of course, it was only then that I realised I was just focusing on my bit. I wasn't really listening to what he was saying. <laughs> so you know, right. I I was trying to remember that, do my bit. It was. It was horrible, and it and it got to the point where some guy just in the audience just said, "He goes, oh, mate, he goes, uh, tell us a joke, right there," and and I was like in a panic, like I just thinking, I don't know any jokes, <laughs> <laughs> but like I'm a comedian, I'm a I'm bound to know, I'm a splash, splash, must know jokes. Um, uh, my mind is racing like this, trying to sort of appear calm, and I said, um, yeah, yeah, and. Um, I said, all right, uh, yeah, I'll tell you a joke. Three blokes go into a pub like that. And then everyone 
shut up then they were like oh wow he knows he's got a joke brilliant so I went and I didn't I had not that's all I had that's I had the first line three guys going to a bar three mm-hmm. blokes going to a pub that's it mm-hmm. and then so they went yeah so they were like all right yeah go on then. and I went um and then I thought well what am I, am I going to do I don't have anything mm-hmm. so I said um so to buy time I said four four there was four uh blokes actually it was four guys so so there's four guys actually, and then I went. I, when I think about it now, there was actually five. It was about five guys. It was a five guys. Right? So five guys. I say five. It was ten, probably ten, and it just went on and on and on. I kept adding numbers of guys. So it was like thousands, tens of thousands, and just went on and on and on. And this great big shaggy dog story, and he was getting laughs. <laughs> so I was thinking, this is it. It was like a light bulb moment went off. I was like, I should just let go of these preconceived routines and just preform it mm. and see where it goes. I think you're so right about we, we we hold on so tightly to what we're supposed to do and how it's done mm. and worry about it in the moment that we're just to let go mm. and see what happens. Like, okay, you could go somewhere or you could flop, but you yeah. know, just go for it, just try it. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. I love that story. Yeah, it was a bit of a. <laughs> yeah. It was a, a, a definitely a, a, a sort of watershed moment mm-hmm. in in my whole comedy sort of. Well, you were very verbally fluent, and I feel like I'm not really. So when I'm speaking and trying to think at the same time, I really struggle with that. Do you feel like you have maybe? a skill that's better than other people where you can talk and think simultaneously about what's coming next? Well, I think that any comic will will say that they really um, come alive when they're in front of an audience. And I think that is unusual. I think one of the... It always shows up in these surveys of the greatest fears that people have is standing up in front of people talking, which makes people clam up. Yeah. But not only that, mm-hmm. trying to make people laugh. I mean, what a reckless kind of thing <laughs> that is. I mean, you know, I mean that potential to go wrong is huge. So I think there's a it's quite a you know, an unusual and sort of, you know, odd bunch of people that become comedians. Um I think what I've noticed about myself over the last few years, well, certainly, you know, it, you know, since I've started doing it or rethinking about it with any degree of, you know, any more, you know, sort of analysis, and that is that sometimes I love to take a risk. I actually like the feeling of standing up in front of people and starting down the road of something and not knowing where it's going to go mm-hmm. and just seeing where it takes me. And that, I think, is a kind of... Uh, it's almost like an extreme sport. Yes, it <laughs> is. Know? It's very like adrenaline. It is like, like, like field. Yeah. Yeah. It, it feels like, ah, you know, mm-hmm. I feel like, you know, doing a bungee jump or something or skydiving mm-hmm. or you know, something like that. It's like, I remember I did this in, in Wembley, at Wembley Arena, and there was like 13,000 people. And I started a routine I'd never done before in front of anyone. That's I just, <laughs> you know, I'd yeah. never performed it in front of a crowd before. And I thought, well, this, we don't know where we go with it. Ooh, it feels like when you start, it's like a roller coaster. But I love that sense of like excitement and adrenaline that it. Have that you it always been gives. like that, or is it something that you've trained yourself to do? Uh, I think I've always loved the thrill of um, performance. I think I like that, the extra pressure that that brings to bear, you know, like. You know, I've always found that when I've, you know, been in front of people or had to perform, there's some other element takes over mm. where I'm able to be calm in that moment rather than be nervous and kind of climb up. Mm-hmm. Actually, I'm sometimes a bit sort of nervous and, you know, I sometimes, I you know, when I'm asked about things, like in situations like this, sometimes, I mean, I'm, I've, I've improved myself a lot over the years, but being able to talk about it, I wasn't able to talk about it really much. I didn't really know what I was doing, but I knew what I was doing when I was on stage, you know? So it was a kind of a, it's a, it's a performance gene, whatever you want to call it, mm. an, an affinity and not being able to, um, 
talk about it before, but now I'm on stage. Yeah, I can talk about it. Mm. You know, I can. I'm. I feel comfortable. Mm. There's a certain amount of stress that mm. is very. It, it helps you to be like more engaged, more yeah. um, alert, more. You know, your your whole body sort of activated. Yeah. But I suppose it's only when it's to the point where you get so much stress that it becomes almost paralyzing. So you need just the right amount. Yes. And also you need to view the stress as something that is exciting and positive as yeah. opposed to the negative. Yes, you use it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Channel it. Yes. Yeah. You know, I and um, I used to get quite nervous when I was on stage, but then I realized that that was just nervous energy. And then you need to be able to, you, you learn, you train yourself to do it over the years, to focus that, channel it into the performance. You've shared a stage with Robin Williams. Yes. Who was an amazing comedian mm. and also somebody who was deeply unhappy mm. uh, to the point of committing suicide. Yeah. Um, and... I was researching this, trying to find out if comedians have some sort of a track record for depression, and it seems that there isn't. And I was thinking about it, and I was like, is it some sort of cognitive dissonance that we think of, you know, if a comedian is depressed or unhappy, then that just doesn't fit the mold, because it's like, how can they make so many people happy yeah. and yet be so unhappy at the same time? What are your thoughts on that? Do you feel like comedians have some sort of you know, depressive qualities on a whole or, hmm. yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think there was always this, uh, this uh, perception that uh, a lot of comedians were disproportionately um, depressed, you know, they, they suffer from depression and that comedy was some kind of coping of mechanism coping with it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, uh, to be honest, I th I think it's it's a bit of a myth. I think I think that I think depression um, uh, afflicts so many people across all kinds of different you know backgrounds, um, jobs. It's no respecter of anything. It can ha it happens to anyone in any situation. And I think also, um, sadly, it's very common. And I think that you know just by the law of averages, <laughs> you know, there's going to be in every profession. A certain percentage of people that suffer from depression and I think that comedians are no different mm -hmm. but I think that people perceive it as some kind of corollary to their the comedy like how can you be depressed mm -hmm. when you're making people laugh or, or perhaps it's the tears of the clown or you're all you know it's all you know fun for the audience but you're depressed at home I think that is a, it's a kind of a trope that's been applied to comedians but actually it's it's something that applies to everyone. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't know that because that was my common thinking that mm. actually, you know, that was some sort of a coping mechanism. And, you know, you kind of go on stage, make fun of yourself when you're like either deeply insecure. But I think it's the case is just, you know, mental health is not something that we well, we are talking about it now, but mm. it's been something that has been <laughs> laced with you know taboo and yeah. you know something that we should be ashamed of and it affects everybody even if you're on oh, stage yeah. making people happy yes um what was it like to share a stage with with him oh it was it was for me as a as a as a, a, a comedian but also a huge fan i mean mm -hmm. it was an amazing experience um he was very funny as you can imagine but also very generous very self-deprecating, uh, very sort of humble. He was very, um, you know, deferential to me as a, as a, you know, as a, a, a comedian who was obviously much lesser in stature and, and fame. And but he was, you know, he he was never grand about anything. He was um, uh, very very charming and uh, and just so funny. I mean, we spent an afternoon writing this song. Honestly, I think I've never laughed as much. We just laughed and laughed for hours and hours. And uh, it was, you know, it was this we've been performing for well, King Charles, as he is mm -hmm. now. And um, for his, uh, I think it was his 60th birthday. Oh, what a laugh we had. We said, And there's things in he was, you know, in this afternoon, he was just coming up, riffing, coming up with ideas, thoughts. You know, he was just firing off ideas the whole time and you know he seemed full of full of ideas full of creativity you know just brimming with comedy 
No. Um, I guess that's why people would find it quite almost shocking that he would privately be, you know, so low mm. as to uh, to take his own life. Mm. But, uh, you know, I mean, I, th I think that, as I say, it's it's so it's so quite depressingly, tragically common. Mm. No, it's 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 true, and I think why we find it so difficult to cope with is because it's like oh we didn't even notice or we didn't see yeah. it because it can go so undetected. Yes. Or you don't, you know, you don't spot the signs, or we've not been taught to to spot the signs. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, we're talking around Christmas time as well, which yeah. is laced with this ideal of being happy around your family, of enjoying life, like this is supposed to be, you know, the happiest moment of, of the year. Yeah. And yet for a lot of people, especially, you know, those who may have lost somebody mm. either during this time or, you know, you, you start thinking about family and what's important. Mm. And that's not the case for a lot of people. Like no. what, you know, given what you've been writing in your book, like what what advice would you give to people around this time who want to, I guess, not necessarily feel happy, but how to handle a moment that you're supposed to feel happy yeah. and that you're not? Yes, that's right. I mean, it is. It's a. It, there's a huge expectation, um, which we're sort of. You know, it's all the songs. You know, it's you know it, you can't escape it. You know, like you go into any shop. It's the most wonderful time of the, and it maybe it isn't. It's maybe the least wonderful time of the year for 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 a lot of people. And I think that um, a lot of people just try and you know kind of keep Christmas at arm's length a lot of the time because it it does bring up all these kinds of these thoughts. And it, you know, I, I to be honest, um, I I've over the years. It's it's lovely. It becomes a, a you know it's a family event. It's a family occasion. We tend to focus more on that. We tend to focus more on being together as a family. I think that that's something which I think that you can maybe you know mitigate against all of the sort of you know the the sleigh bells and the enforced jolliness. I think uh, taking time to talk to people, to to phone people up, to communicate to to get in touch maybe that's something which is a is a sort of almost an antidote to all of the the kind of you know the the snowflakes and the mm. the stay bells and the tinsel that sometimes is a bit overwhelming for people that it is you know. definitely overwhelming for me because <laughs> i feel like at the end of the year coming up to christmas it's just this natural deadline it's like oh my god all the things that i have not finished this entire year yeah. i have to finish within like the next yeah. week and then That's with right. that you know everybody's getting sick you know if you have kids like kids are you know you know off from school and then you have to like yeah. prepare all of the you know christmas decorations and presents and so on yeah. i feel like there's just so much pressure to recreate this fantasy as opposed to actually focusing on what it really means yeah and I guess also to take care of yourself and to connect with the others. Yeah, which I think so. Saying. Yeah, mm. I think it's, you know, for me, it's always, a, if, you know, try and um, take time to uh, get in touch with people. I think use that as an, uh, maybe that's it. You can use it as an excuse to do that, you know, mm. to, to, to mm. contact people. We always invite people around the house, neighbours, friends, people that are on their own. You know, I think that's the thing. I, I always feel that it must be awful if you're on your own at Christmas and every time you turn the TV on, it's, oh, we're having the best time. It just, it's mm. annoying more than anything. Yeah. And, um, and I, yeah, and there's, all, and there's all sorts of incidences of, yeah, cases people are sort of, who, who are suffering or who have, as you say, mental health um, issues or are depressed. Christmas is not going to help any of that. And I think that, you know, you can try and mitigate against that by mm -hmm. just, you know, sort of you know, getting in touch with people, yeah. connecting with the family, phoning up people you haven't spoken to in a while. I think anything like that is something which that's what, for me, that's what Christmas is about, really. Mm. Talking about, you know, difficulties and hardships, in your book, you mm. say hardship is not just something that you might overcome to be happy. It's a necessity, a yardstick by which to measure the good times. 
mm. which is so true. And what hardships have you endured and what do they teach you? Uh, well, I'd say um, starting out, that was there was a long period where it was uh, just tough to live, tough to make plans. You know, I was living hand to mouth, you know, um, you earn money from a gig, but it's just enough to get you through the week. So then you have to do another gig and there's no time to plan. You can't really make any plans. And it's fun, but it was also quite relentless. Um, and there was a time when I just thought, how can I, can I keep on doing this? I mean, really, is this, this is sustainable. Am I, this is what I'm going to be doing now for, I've been doing it for a few years. And I was like, I don't know whether I can keep doing this. This is taking a huge toll on my, you know, the, like relationships on just on my health. You know, I was like probably drinking too much, staying up too late, eating late you know, traveling, driving a lot, stressed, you know, lack of sleep. It's not healthy. And then, and so what I did was I took a big risk and, and put a show together and took it to the Edinburgh Festival and put all my money into this show. And that reaped a huge amount of rewards. It was a, it was a big punt, it was a big risk, but from that, a lot of other good things happened. Um, and also I think, um, you know, when, I'd say it wasn't pretty hard, really hardship, but maybe it was a big loss when I lost my mother. My mother died for 15 odd years ago now. And she died relatively young. I mean, she was in her early 70s, which, okay, it's not young, but it's not these, by the med these days. It's not, you know, it, it felt like, you know, it felt like she too was soon. too soon. Yeah. And so that was a that was a big kind of it was a big loss. I really felt that, you know. And um, it, uh, I think, pretty it was it took me a while to get over, you know, because I sort of, you know, I still miss her now, and she was the life and soul. She was a great force of energy, and uh, you know, she was a real in, in, instrumental in me playing the piano, she encouraged me, she was always a sort of someone you can, you know, who would inspire, push you to do things. She was a, she was a great force, you know, and, and when she went, it was a bit, it was like a big gap, you know, and I, and I sort of think about it now, and it's, it's been a long time since, you know, but my dad, my dad's now 90, you know, and I think he's, you know, he's been on his own now for years as a result. So it was a big loss. But yeah, um, and then I guess, um, you know, I think loss is is why I equate with that. You know, you mm. you kind of, you find, a, you know, ways of dealing with it. But yeah, it's, it's How tough. How long did it take you? Because you said she passed away 15 years ago. Yeah. How long do you feel it took you to feel okay with it? To process it? Um, well, it, I think grief is a very odd thing. It's, it affects people in different ways. You know, it, it sometimes it doesn't manifest itself straight away, and it, it you you you're sort of you cauterize yourself to it. You know, and you 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 kind of deal with the practicalities, and then it will just come back somewhere somehow, completely out of the blue. Mm -hmm. It could be anything. It could be a you know piece of music. It could be a sensation, a taste, a look, a certain place that you're in, that 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 somehow triggers this memory. And the memory is, is sometimes overwhelming. And that happened to me with my mum when um, and she died. And and I, you know, was dealing with it, helped my dad, and we sorted out some practicalities. And, and then a year later, of all places, I was in uh, LA and I was doing a show <laughs> and, um, and honestly, I mean, this is—I would say—if you—if you're not feeling great, LA is not a place to be. <laughs> okay. No. <laughs> because every time we go into a shop, people say, "How are you? How are you doing? How are you doing today? How are you doing today?" They don't say hello. 
mm-hmm. like in a shop in the, you know, in, in the UK. Or so anywhere. keep your business to yourself. Yeah, it's like, you yeah. know, right? You mm-hmm. know, they, they, you go into a shoe shop, they don't go, hey, how are you doing? They just go, yeah, all right, what do you want? You know, in LA, how are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? Relentless. And then, then I cracked. I was, I was in a, I was in some shop, some deli or something. And I just cracked and they said, how are you doing? I said, well, I'm not really doing that well, to be honest. <laughs> I was like, mm-hmm. this is like the last thing they wanted to hear. They, they, they were like, I don't really want to know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just a, it's just a, a, you a know, polite, just a hello. polite hello. Mm-hmm. But I just went, no, I'm really not doing that well. I said, I'm really, I mean, I lost my mum a year ago, and I'm really doing. <laughs> and you could, see, you could see them like thinking, okay, we get it. You know, they were like looking around for security. You know, and it really, I don't know, just all came out then, mm-hmm. and um, it was really quite overwhelming i think because you know of all the things that you think about in just the, the year to process it all and um and i think also because you know we just had a child who so you know it was and he i was so grateful that she'd seen our you know our son you know so she knew she was a, a grandma you know so that was a big thing mm-hmm. and all of that came because he was with us and all the memories of that you know came up so i think that I think, yes, I mean, I've been very lucky. I never forget that I've been very fortunate, you know, that I've been quite lucky in my career. I've always, you know, I, I work always. I mean, I always have been working. I've always made work for myself. So I've always earned money, enough money to kind of keep things going. So I've never, you know, it's never been hardship in that sense. But I think that, yes, moments of loss are, one, are the ones that... Um, that really stand out. Mm. Well, I think, you know, we're always taken aback or, you know, when the rug has been pulled out of your feet, it's things that you don't necessarily expect that have, yeah. you know, the impact on us. And, you know, hardship is, a lot of it is is psychological and the loss of someone that you love is mm. so deep. And I mean, for me, obviously I've lost my mum, my stepfather, you know, quite closely together. Mm. And they were both very young and going, just accepting the fact that you are no longer a child when you lose a parent. Mm. I think that has been something that's difficult to, yes. to process. But, um, but yeah, I mean, we all get affected by different things, but for sure, like losing someone is, is, yeah. is tough. Yeah. yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I lost a very good friend of mine last year. Uh, comedian Sean Long and uh, we were very close and we, we, we'd been close for years mm-hmm. and it was one of those things that a friendship that you think will last and for the rest of our lives and when he died it was very much like oh how, how am I gonna you know share he was like you know my closest friend and mm-hmm. I you'd share things you'd ask for advice it was like a you know someone to rely on and that's now he's Apart from the loss of him as a, a great comedian, a great friend, it's almost mm-hmm. like I've lost a, a a bit of my, you know, mooring. You know, I mean, I had someone to to kind of keep me right. I'd phone him and say, "What do you think of this?" And he would give me great advice. And I'd, I'd go, "Okay, yeah." And, and having that taken away, it's a, that's a big that's a big loss. Mm. You know, it's just not having control over it. It's yeah. just something that happens to you. That you just yeah you can't you control just, it you don't you don't decide when that happens and how it happens no. yeah but actually Sean he, he would say to me this he was he was a great one for the Greek philosophers he read you know very widely and he, this thing he said to me which which has always stayed with me and will always stay with me and he said that there's nothing much we can do about life but the one thing that we can control is how we feel about it you know things happen to us beyond our control. And there's no way we can predict what's going to happen. But what we can do is we can control the way we deal with it. We can try and, you know, that's the one thing that we have control over, how we Mm. feel about it, how we deal with it. Mm. It's the hardest thing in the world. It is the hardest thing. (laughs) But it's not impossible. It's something that we can all practice to, um, to do. And that's so, so true. Yeah. Well, changing direction a bit. Yeah. Um, the first performance that I've seen you 
live was at the Royal Opera House. Oh, yes, yeah. And, you know, they're very particular about who they let oh, there. Yes. Not many comedians have really graced the stage. No. How did you feel about that performance and performing there? No, that's right. I mean, it's just, uh, it was a huge honour for one thing and quite daunting, as you say, because it's quite a, an, it's an iconic venue. Mm -hmm. You know, when you, you realise that as you, you know, you're walking through the halls and the corridors and, you know, you think, oh my, look at all these people that have performed here. Oh yeah. my God, they're, they're, this, you know, this is, this is one of the, the great venues of the world, you know. I mean, Haydn, you know. <laughs> Used to used to sort of try out his his pieces of music there. You think this is there's a huge legacy of um, uh, uh, an incredible r roll call of the great you know musicians, singers, opera singers, the ballet. So yeah, it was quite daunting, and and I think that it did. They did take some persuading, you know, because you know I think some of the board were a little bit. Dubious, you know, comedian. <laughs> What's he doing here? What's he doing here, though? Yeah, yeah. That's right. So, but I think, you know, of of any comic that I know, and I think of just thinking objectively, because I incorporate a lot of music in my show. Not just a little. Well, a lot. There's a lot of music. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also, you know, I'm, you know, working with Florence Vorostovsky, as you know, you know, Flo. In the show, you know her. Um, I wanted to incorporate opera there, so I just thought I'm, I'm actually acknowledging where we are, and at the same time, you know, putting on the show that I do normally, which is incorporates lots of music. So, I guess I think um, in the end, it's the perfect venue, ironically, to do comedy in because, you know. Opera is quite similar in some ways. You have one person you focus on. There's a, there's a singer. Yes, you might have a you know a duet. You might have a chorus, but it's very much focused on characters. You and there's um, you know there's a story. There's you know there's a bit of drama. There's some you know the, it's not quite the same in terms of interaction with the audience, but I just think that. The um, the way the opera house is is actually configured, where you have the boxes and then you have the stalls, it's it brings a great deal of focus, you know, onto the stage, and and I have a lot of instruments on the stage as well, so it becomes I think it's a great it's a place which is designed for performance, and and that's you know that's what I do, you know, mm. I play lots of instruments, um, it works well with music. I thought actually when I I did the first year there when, when when it was in the lockdown when we had to do um, when we had to do a distanced um, performance there, and that was great. You know that was great fun. So so performing there with a full crowd, no mask. I mean it was joyous. Mm. You know? Yes, because it was just as we were all coming out of that and just being allowed mm. to be amongst people. And I remember sitting in the audience, but having to be sort of slightly sort of apart from people. Yeah. Um, but just going back and realizing just how much a physical in-person performance, how that makes you feel. I mean, we were talking yeah. about that earlier in terms of, you know, this, you can't take away that, you can't sort of recreate that feeling of being somewhere with a live performance in no. front of you. No, you can, you can have all the streaming live stream shows you know you, you can watch all of those you can sit at home watching netflix uh for you know till the cows come on but being in an audience where something's happening in front of you and you're sharing this experience you can't replicate that yeah well you're talking about the communal experience as well mm. and that's just so so key yeah what did you enjoy more strictly come dancing or performing at the royal Opera House. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a tricky question, uh, mm. Marie. I mean, what you've done there, you see, you said, do you like these apples or these oranges? <laughs> you know, that is very much... Mm, I'm trying to make you pick something. Yes, you're making me try to pick. How can you make me pick between those mm. things? Um, ugh, it's very difficult. I mean, I would say, uh, if you're asking me, honestly, which one did I enjoy, then I would say the Opera House, mm -hmm. because... I was in my comfort zone 
this is what I do. You know, I love playing with an audience. I love having a big stage and all of that. That's what, you know, I live for that. Uh, and yes, I did have an absolutely brilliant time on Strictly, but occasionally, <laughs> I can't say that I would class that as enjoying it. It was tough. It was really, really hard. I was way out of my comfort zone. And there was times when I was actually genuinely nervous. I mean, I was getting the nerves. I was, you know, once I was out there on the ball and on the dance floor, then that would thing we were talking about, mm -hmm. you know. You're the light, on. The light comes on, mm -hmm. you're on. Mm -hmm. You've got to perform. You channel the nervous energy. You just, you know, you do it. But all the training and the prep and the, and the kind of just the build up to that show at the Saturday night the dancing art oh, was it was tense. Mm. Why did you decide to do it? Well, they've asked me a lot of times before. Mm -hmm. I've never been able to do it because it's a big time commitment, it's weeks and weeks of work. And I just thought, I can never I can't commit to this amount of time. Particularly if you do well in the competition. Mm. You know, well you, you won. Well I won, yeah I know. So I mean you're in there there's weeks mm -hmm. and weeks of work. And and I thought, but you know, this is a once in a century situation here where everyone's confined to their homes. Nobody can go out. I can't go out. I can't do any gigs. I can't do any shows, even if I wanted to. You know, it's just not possible. Mm -hmm. If there ever was a time that I would gonna do this, now is it. And uh and I thought I probably won't get asked many more times. And <laughs> You know, they're going to give up. They're going to give up. Yeah, they'll just <laughs> yeah. they'll give up. They'll, yeah, he's not doing it. Mm -hmm. And I and I just thought once we get back to normal, whatever that is, then I'm not going to be able to do it because you know you know you know it's like when you're touring when you're doing gigs when particularly you know performance is like that time September up to Christmas is like. That's when you tour. That's when you. That's your prime touring time. That's when I'm always away. I'm always doing things. I'm never, I'm never going to be able to do this. So, this is it. I grasped the nettle. Mm -hmm. Did you think you'd win? No, <laughs> I didn't think I would win. No, I. All, all I thought was, I'm going to give it my best shot. I'm going to throw myself into it and immerse myself in it, and I might learn something. You know, at best. I might learn a bit about dance and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll probably improve my posture and I'll, I'll get some benefits from it. I'll, there'll be some good that will come from it. I didn't think for a minute that we, that we would do well, mm -hmm. it's much less win. I mean, I didn't, that was, in, <laughs> was not on my radar at all. Yeah. But it's amazing how, you know, you just sort of threw yourself in there mm. and, you were incredible, really incredible. Well, that's very kind to say. I, <laughs> I surprised myself. How did what you learn at Strictly inform mm. any future performances for you? Um, well, actually, I think they did. I mean, I think mm. they really, the experience uh, did um, put me in a, position where I was really out on a limb, even more than when I'm trying out new material in front of people that I'd never tried before. This was something totally new, really. You know, the, the experience is, 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 I mean, it's overwhelming. That's why you see people get very emotional and then everyone watches it and go, oh, look at them all crying. But it's, you can't help it. It's so overwhelming. It's intense. All you do is train, you train for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, week after week after week, and then you it's and then you're almost you've got this tremendous relief when the, if the dance goes well and you know, I haven't fallen over and set fire to the studio, you know, which I thought was going to happen. But what I gained from it, which is what your question was, was that <clears throat> an even greater ability to control the nervous energy like almost to the point where you, I was in a kind of Zen state. And that I think was what I gained from it. Apart from, you know, the fun of, and, and I still dance in the show now. I mean, I put a bit of Charleston in, you know, a bit of jive, but you know, because I love dance. Mm -hmm. I love the feeling of dance. Mm -hmm. But in terms of how, what I get, got from that and gained from it and put it into my show was yes, this 
inc incredible almost. I mean, I'm surprised myself. This ability to 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 calm nerves and to and also to think I I, I, I had no idea I was capable of that. I think mm -hmm. what it does it, it, it and a lot of contestants you if you watch any of these shows you'll they, they say the same thing and it is true and that is that it makes you realize you're capable of more than you thought i think that's the key particularly for a non-dancer like me someone who's for, i've never danced never taken choreography i didn't know what i was doing i was all over the place the first few weeks <laughs> but then you learn that you and you learn and by learning you gain confidence. It gives you huge confidence. It gives you confidence, gives you able ability to control your nerves, but also a sense of like, of going out of your comfort zone and learning a skill. You surprise yourself in terms of what you're able to achieve. I think that's the big, the big take home mm. for me. And that's it. If you don't try, you're never going to get that feeling. You're never going no. to build on that confidence. No. Yeah, no, that's so Yeah. That's so true. I think a lot of the times we're just, you know, I say we, you know, talking about a lot of people who are too scared to try something or yeah. you kind of think about it, oh, but I'm not going to do it. And it's like the the point of it is just to do it and then no matter what happens you will learn from it yep. and you can then move forward but just the act of doing it is already you know that step towards greater confidence yeah whereas if you don't then it's actually building on the reverse i think so i think fear of failure is a big hindrance to a lot of people mm. you know embarrassment you know the humiliation oh i don't want to do that or i might f fall on my face and it would just and i and and I understand that, and and you know, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in that in that sort of public forum. It could be anything. It could be about you know, learning a skill, learning an instrument, setting yourself a challenge. You know, a physical challenge, a run. You know, a long run, a five k run, a marathon, just or something. You know, even you know, you start set yourself goals. You gradually increase them. I think that's a great. For me, that's a great life skill that I've learned. Mm -hmm. Is that you set goals, things for yourself, not ludicrously unachievable, unrealistic ones, but realistic goals, and then having a plan, seeing it through. One of life's great pleasures, I think. Mm -hmm. One of the greatest things you can do: simple plan, plan it, execute it, move on. There's no better than that for me. Do you have a process for planning goals? Is it something that you do regularly? Yeah, all the time. Mm. You know, um, planned, you know, I love to do that. I love to plan. I'm planning a thing now. I'm planning a, a walk, a great hike across Scotland. And um, it's building on the last walk that we did. It was 100 miles. And that was tough. But it was on a path and there were, it was well signposted. And the next one is 200 miles and it's not signposted. You need maps and compasses. You have to navigate yourself. So it's a bigger challenge. You know, the diving, I learned to dive, but that, you know, I want to go to the next level. I want to get to the advance. And so we did the advance. Then I want to do this. And I, want to do the, I want to become a rescue diver. I want to be able to, if I'm in the water and somebody gets in trouble, it means you can help them out. Things like that, I just think, I think I never want to stop learning gaining knowledge i think that's something perhaps as a reaction to the fact that i didn't pursue an academic career maybe that's it you know i'm just making up for that but i think i would have done it anyway regardless mm. of what i would have done looking at education when you're forced to learn mm. or that you're expected to learn versus learning on your own and actually being curious enough yourself to decide what you want to study and then just go deeper and deeper into that. Mm. And I think that's way more valuable because, you know, mm. you don't stop at getting a degree. Like life is all about learning. You just yeah. continuously do that. And what I like about what you're saying is that there's just continuous learning, gradual improvement, set, yeah. you know, getting the goalpost further. And you also come across as a person, it's like we've achieved that, you are satisfied, 
And then you're like, okay, but let's, let's next. Let's move on. Yeah. What's next? And I really admire that. And I really wish I could be more like that. So, well, <laughs> mm. it's, I mean, it takes a long time, I think. It's taken me a long time to, to understand that, to know yourself and know what your um, skills are, what your strengths are, limitations are. I think one of the great sort of lessons of life is to learn all those things about yourself, to know yourself better. Um, you know, I always think that was, it always used to make me laugh when people would say, you know, um, what are the things you want to do with, you know, in life? You know, then people would do surveys and it would be like, what are your top 10 things to do before you die? The things you want to tick off, a bucket you know, list. a bucket mm -hmm. list. Mm -hmm. And it would always be pretty much always, not, not always, but almost exclusively, thrill seeking like moments of absolute instant gratification a bungee jump you know jump out of a plane uh you know swim with a dolphin sharks a shark mm -hmm. something you know something mm -hmm. like that something ah something, and then you could mm -hmm. and i and not one person ever said 10 things you've ever done try and understand yourself a bit better <laughs> you know what I mean like yeah uh, apply a bit of self-knowledge um you know understand your strengths and limit and your expectations learn a language you know uh I mean these to me are far more important but you know I guess these lists are always about these kinds of they're not exciting they're not glamorous they're not exciting, and they're no. actually really hard work yeah over long periods of time and yeah. You're right about the instant gratifications. Like we would just want to achieve things straight away. Yeah. But really, when you break down to it, like it takes years, you know, months, days, years to get somewhere to progress. Yeah. You know, it's not something that just happens overnight. Yeah. Mm. And I think that's, and then just, you know, going back to the happiness thing, I think that's why so many people's, uh, you know, desire for happiness doesn't work out. Because actually, you haven't really defined what happiness is. You think it's you're equating it with excitement, pleasure, sensuality, sensual pleasure, gratification, instant, um, a hedonistic thrill. Whereas actually, it isn't quite as exciting as that. And you don't actually equate that with with what those things are. I think happiness is, you know like I talk about a little bit about it in the book, you know, I didn't want to go into it in some great academic detail, but it interests me that the Greeks, when they were trying to figure out what happiness was, there was one school of thought, which was like, it's not about this. It's about living a good life. It's not necessarily pleasure, which is great. I mean, we all want pleasure, but it might not necessarily do it for you. Mm. You know, it might not be enough. Mm. You might want a bit more. But it isn't enough. I think it's it's a package of happiness, right? Because yeah. you have to hit certain, you know, you, if you don't have any pleasure in your life, you're probably quite miserable. Yeah. So I think there is definitely, you know, required. Yeah. <laughs> but when you're talking about sort of the fulfillment satisfaction, that comes from doing hard things and overcoming things mm. as opposed to just getting them instantly. Because I mean, we live in a world where there's so many things that are available to us yeah. and yet we're deeply unhappy that, yeah. you know, no matter how many privileges you have, you know, it's it's not satisfying in itself. So there needs to be some sort of struggle to, to get there, but enough for you to feel that you can overcome those challenges. Mm. And I think this is where putting yourself out there and testing the boundaries of what you can do and building on that, I think that's what creates lasting happiness. Yeah. Just we have to put in the work to do that. Yes. Yeah, you've got to put the hours in. Yes. Yes, indeed. <laughs> do you make New Year's resolutions? Uh, I t no. Mm. <laughs> I tend not to um, because, uh, you know, I always think that... Um, Unless it's something that, you know, I mean, they say like if you were going to give up smoking or something, I think that that's, that's, that's not a bad one to do that. But I think it puts extra pressure on you if you say you've, you've you know, had a New Year's resolution. I think that you 
telling people what you're going to do is good. I think that's that's the way to do it. You know, it gets you to commit. It gets you to commit. Yeah, mm. and I think that's probably has a more um, impact than. But if you can, yeah, if that's a New Year's resolution as well, and you've told everyone about it, I think great. If you can combine the two, yeah. Mm. I don't believe in that, but and I think you set your goals throughout. They're not dependent on the time of the year. No. And I mean, it's it's nice to have sort of you know the start fresh, but I think a lot of people just start well. Yeah. But then very hard to maintain yeah. that. I think actually, New Year's resolutions always tend to be things like, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna you know be a do this. I'm gonna take more exercise. You know, that's a classic one. You know, I'm gonna join a gym. And then I'm gonna, you know, quit get it in fit. February. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, mm-hmm. you know, it's the classic, isn't it? All the gym mm-hmm. memberships go sort of yeah. fizzle out. In, that's where they make the most money yeah. is in January. Yeah, you know, um, you know, that's the classic. You know, I'm gonna do these things and be positive and improve. And it's a kind of again, it's a bit like Christmas. It's imposing this this pressure on people to try and sort of make a new start and trying to improve themselves artificially. And actually, I think. Um, the, the origins of New Year's resolutions is, is more realistic. And it was the Mayans that came up with the, the idea of a New Year's resolution. Mm. And at the end of the year, you, uh, you sort of, you kind of almost, you, you've taken the word literally, they resolve a few issues and problems. And one of the things they used to do was, this is, well, which I love, it's just a simple thing, but the Mayans would return uh, things that they borrowed. So if they borrowed some farming equipment from their neighbours, at the end of the year would be the time to return it. I think to resolve something is a, probably a better use of that. Mm. You know, you know what I mean. To actually like pick tie up off loose ends, tie up the loose ends, mm-hmm. pick up a phone, mm-hmm. maybe talk to someone, make a tough call, someone, a thing that you've been putting off, like. You got to talk to. Oh, I don't want it. Yeah, but you really got to. Oh, yeah. That's the time to do it. You know, um, that to me is a, probably you know a harder thing, but probably a better way of using that time. Time. Yeah. yeah. No, that makes sense. I mean, I I don't believe in New Year's resolutions. I feel that it's as you said, an artificial way of of creating them. And yes, for some people it might work, but I feel like. It should happen throughout the year, not something, yeah. you know, arbitrary that be like, okay, just, you know, this is the moment everyone's doing it, so I will as well. Yeah. Um, do you have any advice for your younger self? Uh, well, I would say um, that uh, to have more confidence and things will work out. And how do you have more confidence? Well, I think you you just trust in yourself a bit more. Take a bet on yourself. Mm-hmm. And that's something I've learned to do over years. But it's hard. It takes time. And I wasn't perhaps as confident as I was, as I am now, back then. And I think, yeah, there's a kind of certain youthful recklessness that we all have where we just think yeah things will be fine and i don't i don't mean that i mean in terms of like creatively you know i think write write songs poetry perform you know do all of those things but you have so much time to develop that and you can make mistakes and you know, it's fine. Don't worry about it. You know, I didn't really start doing comedy properly, seriously, till I was 30. You know, so I had 10 years of traveling and performing and being in shows and getting life experience. I didn't really know what I was going to do. Didn't matter. You find your way to something that makes you happy. Something that makes you feel fulfilled as a person you know it doesn't necessarily happen straight away mm-hmm. yeah things take time as we said oh yeah and what about advice to 
regular people. So again, not necessarily creatives or, you mm. know, performers. And I take this from, you know, you having had so many different interests and combining so many different things. Mm. How do you find your own voice? You know, I think if the one thing I would say to every, anyone, regardless of what their chosen path is or whether they, you know, whatever job, whatever background, whatever kind of, whatever life has thrown up for them, you just have to put the time in to whatever it is that you're doing. You have to just stick at it, you know. I think sometimes people try something and it uh, didn't work out and then, uh, you know, and they kind of just come somewhere else and they try something else. Really give everything to anything that you want to do, 100%, all in, because that way then you either know very quickly this isn't for you or it starts to, you know, you start to reap benefits from it. But I think doing things by halves is not going to do any favours. <clears throat> and what are you working on now? What's what's the future for you? Well, um, I've got um, a few TV projects I'm working on, uh, all of which are going to be um, filmed uh, next year. Um, two of them are projects which, actually, funny enough, is, is all exactly what we've been talking about. One of them is about um, old crafts, old skills that have been dying out, things like wood carving and metalwork and stained glass, beautiful crafts which have only got a few practitioners left. And it's celebrating all of that and encouraging young people to, you know, to get involved in these, you know, skills, and become mm -hmm. craftsmen. Um, and uh, one of them uh, is, a, is a TV drama. And then writing. Um, so writing a um, new show and uh, a new tour and hopefully performing at the Opera House again. No, oh, yes. No, can't wait for that. Mm. Actually, one question I have, which I, I was using chat GPT. I don't know if you know what this is, but no. it's a, a program created by OpenAI. It's an AI learning assistant that oh. has learned so much data and it can have a conversation with you. You can ask it anything. Wow. Um, and it has information up to 2021. And so I was asking questions about you. And it, I said, what's maybe some you know, less than known facts about Bill Bailey. Yes. And it came up with that you've written a book that obviously you've written several books, but I'm just trying to find the name of it. What's it called? And I was like, did you write this or is this complete like misinformation? So let me find it. Where is it? Here we go. It's called The Cosmic Joke, A Guide to Life, the Universe and Why We're Here. Oh, because if you didn't write it, I think you should. It sounds like something I should have written. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> no. Mm. Uh, I didn't write that. No, but that's interesting because my first stand-up show was called Cosmic Jam. Mm. I don't know. That's very odd. What yes. a coincidence. Yes. Well, I don't think it's a coincidence. I think it might have been something out there in the world on yes. the internet. But, yeah, um, probably, yeah. Yes. Well, Bill, thank you so much. Fascinating no. talking to oh, you. And yeah, really a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me here on Anatomy of a Leader. What did you discover in this episode? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments on YouTube or reviews on Apple Podcasts. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe or follow buttons and I'll see you next week.